Good evening. My name is Professor Hillary. Welcome to Panacea Casebook. Panaceas have always been the reserve of charlatans, mountebanks and travelling salesmen, selling their wares and moving quickly on before they can be caught up with. Such things as Dover's powders and uh, what you will have been sold with wild claims for their effects. Nowadays you might think of vitamins or uh, Prozac, Viagra. But these days, modern drugs are properly tested using double-blind crossover controlled trials and variations thereof, where placebo is taken into account and uh, controls and what have you, and it's all statistically analyzed and the results presented formally and in a legal fashion. Good clinical practice uh, guides um, uh, informed consent and ensures that no, uh, nothing dangerous is done to a healthy volunteer. The trials are done on animals and then on human beings and then on the sick. It's an extremely expensive business. And the investment made by the drug companies is patent driven. A true panacea that could cure all ills would indeed be a wonderful thing. But it might not be good for business. A few years ago, um, a, a, a group of artists uh, 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 came into my consulting room. Um, anxious, nervous, worried lot. Uh, worried that, 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 uh, that they, well, they were trying to make art that would, uh, that would make a difference, make people feel better about themselves or, or something. Um, and, uh, and they were worried that it, was, uh, it wasn't going anywhere. Well, I suppose, not so much that it wasn't going anywhere, that, that they didn't know where it was going. They wanted to know if we could apply the principles of pharmaceutical testing and scientific rigor uh, to uh, the, the more, uh, shall I say, airy-fairy world of art practice. And... Uh, well, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, 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 I'm not sure I saw anything in it, but I liked them. I liked them very much. And I thought, yeah, I could, I, let's get together. We, we, so we set up a project uh, that we called the, the, to test uh, their, their panacea. The panacea is what they'd um, uh, rather charmingly named their, 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 their project. And, and, and so I set about with them, uh, and a lot of heated debate and discussion, uh, to try to apply the, apply the principles of pharmaceutical scientific testing and rigor uh, to, 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 the, to their arts. And, and the idea was to devise a sort of a, a prototype, I suppose, um, that could be applied ultimately to all art. And so art also uh, uh, could have a, 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 a uh, uh, a, uh, a sort of quality of assessment uh, based on its um, health giving uh, potential. And so, it, and, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, uh, one might even be able to prescribe it um, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a sickly uh, person or, or, or to a community. Case 389, Pharmaphilia. A 34-year-old Caucasian female with an obsessive addiction to pharmaceutical products was referred to the Panacea team. Each time the subject passed a pharmacy, she was lured in by the green neon crossing. <laughs> she was convinced that
that pharmaceuticals could solve all our health and lifestyle problems. But when these products failed to match their advertised abilities, she would have to return to the pharmacy to search new solutions. This relatively common but poorly researched ailment combines hypochondria with omnimania, commonly known as compulsive shopping addiction. This combination results in pharma failure. If this condition had been allowed to continue unchecked, the subject would have spent her entire savings on pharmaceuticals, leading to crippling debt without any measurable improvement <coughs> to her health. <laughs> After careful investigation into the patient's medical history, the Panacea team prescribed a, an intensive dose of healing water for one hour each morning and one hour each afternoon <laughs> over the period of seven days. Towards the end of each exposure session, the patient suffered from generalized tonic convulsions. These seizures were controlled by anticonvulsants. As the patient's condition started to deteriorate, her pupils became fixed and dilated three hours after each exposure. However, after the treatment period was completed, the patient showed no physical signs of ill health and was able to pass a pharmacy without entry and establishment. During the subsequent month, the patient's condition started to relapse and she found herself again being drawn into the pharmacy, but at a much lower frequency than before. Therefore, the panacea team has recommended that this treatment be applied at six monthly intervals to ensure that the patient does not regress into her form of addiction. The two aspects of health uh, are measured. Um, uh, are, are mortality and uh, morbidity. Now, mortality is um, a measurement of death, of the number of deaths, the age of death, uh, that, but it's usually uh, uh, written down as the uh, number of deaths per 100,000 of a population, and that's the death rate. And it might also be the average life expectancy. Now, these are all measurements of mortality. Morbidity, on the other hand, is a, is, a, is a question of how well someone is. So uh, uh, you, you might be um, uh, uh, alive, but not enjoying yourself very much. Um, and this is, this is, a, this is a more c complicated uh, question, how to measure morbidity. Um, so, for, so, so one of the ways, and the way that we adopted uh, when, when, uh, during our trials, is uh, to talk about a, a concept called a quali, so a quality-adjusted life year. Um, it, it, it's a way of trying to compare morbidity with mortality. So it's a way of, uh, of measuring um, uh, the morbidity of someone. And it's a way where what you, what you say is you say that a life, uh, if, if a perfectly healthy, perfectly happy uh, person, uh, uh, lives for one year, is counts as one year of life, then someone who's ill, you perhaps say this is, um, the, 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 their life is sort of 90% of, of the equivalent of a happy person who's well. And that, that way you can compare um, certain illnesses, uh, you say that a common cold doesn't reduce the, your happiness by a great deal, so it would be more or less 100 or 99.9% .9 of a year. Um, but someone uh, with, I don't know, a, 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 um, chronic heart disease or something like, like this, who can't, can't walk up a flight of stairs, this person would be said to have a, a very poor um, uh, quality of life. And, and, and you would say that they have only sort of, uh, say, I don't know, 60% of, uh, of a year. And this way you can add up, uh, you can then talk about um, doing uh, uh, procedures in hospital, uh, uh, drugs, or giving them an operation, and you can uh, talk about how much you improve uh, their quality of life, and how, uh, how, how many, uh, by, by talking about how many qualies uh, the, the, the operation or procedure uh, gives them. Case 
The Zidans, a Palestinian family, and their Israeli neighbours, the Rosh, were referred to the Panacea team to treat a seemingly intractable border conflict, focused initially on this <laughs> two metre fence, built by the Rosh father, extending his border into the Zidans' garden. Now, over the years, resentment grew, <laughs> and angry words accelerated to threats of violence. Now, both fathers had a history of DIY, and Mr Zidane, not to be outdone by Mr Roche, built this wall two metres above that of his neighbour. Mr Zidane, himself not wanting to be outdone, took down his fence and built this wall. <laughs> two metres above the Zidane's. On and on and on it went, till both sets of families found themselves living without light, without a view, and seemingly trapped at the bottom of a well. <laughs> now, if this condition had been allowed to continue, then it would manifest itself in uncontrollable bouts of anger and ultimately physical violence. However, after investigation by the Panacea team, we discovered that both sets of families were actually fun-loving outdoor types, but neither had invited the other to a barbecue, <laughs> and certainly hadn't allowed their children to play together. <laughs> Therefore, we prescribed this. Friendly Frontier. A 17 metre inflatable mountain range with escape slides. We had it blessed by these Buddhist monks in a ceremony of peace. And then we had it installed in a period of time when both sets of neighbours had removed their walls in order to build yet higher edifices. Now, initially, both sets of families were delighted by this temporary barrier which maintained their privacy. And the children were drawn to its colourful construction and began to play on the slides, but not daring to go so high as to look over the other side. <laughs> now, by day two, however, both sets of children were seen at the top of the slide, laughing and playing together, and finally slid over to the opposite side, much to the consternation of the parents, who began to shoo them back onto their own side. But on running up the slide themselves, they too found themselves having so much fun, they began laughing and joking with their neighbour, and were soon invited to slide down to the other side and join them for a barbecue. And here, in this animation, which I, I created at home on my computer, <laughs> I can show you what happens. So here comes a little chap up to the top, he gets to the top, and whoosh, there he goes, and his area is caught by his neighbour. These two are having a little jig, these two are clinging, Strangely by the neck. And these two are holding hands. By day four, we were able to remove the friendly frontier altogether. And for the first time, allowing light, a view, and a growing warmth to their neighbour. By the end of the second week, all DIY rivalries had been restricted to building ever more welcoming barbecues and throwing ever more elaborate feasts. And in the long term, the panacea team predict friends from both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian border will come, and thus will spread a healing bar throughout the Middle East. Now, Karl Popper was a was a, a, an Austrian uh, man, um, uh, a philosopher, uh, working in the in the twenties, thirties, uh, that sort of time. Well, that's sort of you made his name. Um, uh, um, and, and he became, uh, first of all, fascinated and then irritated, I believe, by the work of the, the psychoanalysts of Freud and Jung and, and, and such people. And he, uh, uh, um, he, he, he started to uh, uh, think about what the difference was between the work of uh, Freud and the work of uh, someone such as Einstein, um, who he saw as a real scientist, 
while he saw the psychoanalysis, etc., as pseudosciences. And he set out to, 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 to work out why, what, what exactly the distinction was. And his, uh, what he came up with was a theory of falsification. That is, uh, uh, his idea was that the, the um, Einstein made uh, assertions or propositions that you could uh, prove to be untrue. I, I, obviously, you hoped that they wouldn't. But, by, by, but, but nothing that Freud or, or Jung was saying could be proved to be untrue. They could always just say, oh, well, that's all, you know, it came about from another way, or this explains that, or that explains this. But they didn't say anything, any hard facts, as it were. They didn't make any uh, uh, assertions that could be shown to be completely untrue by evidence. And from this, he extrapolated a further theory that, in fact, in science, we don't prove something to be true. We, we allow it to exist until it is proven untrue. So that all our experiments that we're doing, if you like, uh, are set out to try and disprove something. And so we always say that this is, as f so far as we know, this is the truth. But we're always aware that just around the corner there may be an experiment that is, uh, however unlikely, might completely throw out the theory and we have to start again. It's happened uh, many, many times in, in, uh, in my lifetime, but, uh, you know, in science. Uh, so this is, this is the idea of objective truth and, and the principle, uh, the underlying principle of how scientific research works. A 21-year-old South American male was brought to the Panacea team after wandering aimlessly through the city at night, smashing bus stops, spray-painting buildings, and extracting refuse from litter bins. <coughs> When questioned about these antisocial activities, his response was incoherent, though the tone of his voice suggested a deep level of despondency. Extensive research into the subject's history revealed that he spent his formative years in Lençóis, Brazil, a small town surrounded by spectacular countryside. Here, his family kept a small plot of land on which they grew their own food. This gave the subject a feeling, reflected in reality, that he could control his immediate surroundings. The subject came to London for academic study, and after graduating from the London School of Economics, <coughs> remained in the city to work. It was at this point he became depressed. He said, I started to resent the city which uses humans to lubricate its mechanisms, rather than provide resources to enable the lives of its inhabitants to become easier and more rewarding. He was becoming increasingly disenfranchised with civic society due to a growing chasm between his own productive processes and the physical construction of his neighbourhood. Had this condition been allowed to continue, this chronic pattern of behaviour would have led to the willful destruction of both public and private property. This could have led to arrest and been sentenced to a term of imprisonment. Therefore, the Panacea team prescribed the installation of life pots throughout the subject's neighbourhood. This allowed the subject access to life pots whenever he needed. The patient was drawn to the cold, regularly registering his heartbeat by touching the sensors. His new ability to affect the illumination of the city through his own heartbeat empowered him. Healing a schism between himself and his surroundings, this newfound connectivity gave him ownership over his environment. The Panacea team has recommended that life pods be rolled out across the city, though they are aware that this would have significant financial implications given the recent cuts in the NHS City Wellbeing Programme. 
We decided to give the, uh, the participants uh, self, uh, self-referring questionnaires. Now, th- th- these are extremely good uh, for, for uh, testing the happiness and general well-being of an individual. They were uh, uh, taken from, um, from uh, the, 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 the WHO uh, guidelines on, uh, on looking into the issue of well-being and uh, adapted a little uh, for our own purposes. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the punter, uh, 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 the, the participant, um, was given a questionnaire and, uh, uh, before they took part in the art and, and afterwards. And uh, they, they were, these were scored using a, a scoring system uh, devised by myself. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and then the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the results were presented uh, uh, by a, a statistician um, who, who told us, uh, with all his very clever uh, techniques, uh, what it all meant. Case 354, sociophobia. In an estate on the outskirts of Bristol, Noel West, one of the most impoverished parts of the UK, a group of teenagers were identified as the panacea team. <laughs> they were suffering from sociophobia, a fear of society and people in general. This condition can manifest itself in a number of ways. The individuals are not hardwired to act collectively. This can lead to isolation, listlessness, and a lack of direction in life. When brought to the panacea team, the teenagers had entered the final stages of sociophobia. They were no longer able to speak to one another. <laughs> they barely left the confines of Noel West, and they had never made the short journey into the centre of Bristol, which to them was just a distant view of an alien city. They seemed frightened, in fact, of negotiating the scant public transport system, and they were terrified of the night sky. <coughs> The Panacea team recommended that the group perform a ritual that would align them with the wider universe. The ritual involved giving the group glow sticks and teaching them a synchronized dance. (laughs) In order for the ritual to work, the individuals had to move as one organism. repeatedly, and during the process, there was a marked improvement in the group. They began to ask about the city in the distance. One of the group reported, I have this strange feeling, as if I am part of something larger than myself, as if I have some real value within the wider interconnectivity of things. was a remarkable breakthrough. However, still none of the group had taken the steps of making the short journey into the centre of Bristol. The Panacea team decided to change the prescription, instructing that the ritual be performed on an escarpment overlooking the city. This had surprising results. Curiosity grew amongst the inhabitants of Bristol. What was this strange glowing organism that appeared each evening on the horizon in a place they knew nothing about? Gradually, the people of Bristol travelled out to Noel West. The people of Noel West became used to these unexpected visitors and welcomed them as friends. In turn, curiosity, in turn, this inspired confidence in the group. <laughs> to venture out from their neighbourhood and explore foreign land. <laughs> now we come to the question of how uh, did we test the art? Well, um, what we did 
is, uh, first of all, uh, we tested uh, the, the, the whole Panacea uh, Super Spa exhibition um, in, uh, in a gallery uh, uh, at La Pavie uh, en France, um, uh, uh, in the south of France. And, and uh, what, we, what we did is, uh, before the, uh, uh, we, we gave the, um, the, the subjects who were going into the exhibition um, a questionnaire uh, before they went in, um, a pre-exposure questionnaire, and, uh, and then again when they came out, we gave them the same questionnaire, a post-exposure questionnaire. And uh, we were able to uh, then compare uh, the, the pre-exposure with the post-exposure. Um, and to see if there was an improvement. Um, so uh, we, we had a very simple uh, uh, questionnaire. It had about 15 questions on it. Um, and the questions were such things as, um, do you uh, feel happy or unhappy? Uh, do you feel calm or excited? Do you feel uh, concentrated? Or, or are you uh, confused? Etc. Etc. And, um, and we used this, uh, this uh, measuring device, uh, reporting device, called a visual analog scale, or VAS uh, for, for, for short. Um, and uh, it's a very simple uh, 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 way of measuring. It's just a, it's just a line. Uh, it's 10 centimeters long. And at uh, one end, it has the uh, happy uh, or, or calm or whatever. And at the other end, it has the opposite, unhappy, excited, or whatever. And the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, subject uh, uh, simply puts a mark on the line. Um, there we go. Let me show you. to mark how excited or happy they are. So I put it here. Uh, now, now, this is 10 centimeters. So the, uh, the, the, the next thing, the, the next thing I do is, uh, is, is I just measure uh, with a ruler how many centimeters from one end uh, it is. And uh, that, of course, in, in, in millimeters is a percentage. Uh, so if it's 4.6 uh, or 46 millimeters from one end, uh, then he is 46% uh, uh, um, unhappy, or, 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 or if you like, 54% uh, uh, happy. And um, uh, we collected all this data, uh, and then we uh, um, were able to compare it. Of course, we, we also collected such data as their age. Uh, we asked them uh, before they went in if they had any illnesses. Um, we asked them uh, if they'd had anything to drink, if they'd had a bad day at work, uh, so that we would have some idea of, of uh, what, what, what state they were in before they went in, if you like. And, um, and we asked them to do the questionnaires before they had all the free alcohol uh, in, the ga in the party afterwards. <laughs> Case 649, mediaphobia. An 84-year-old woman was referred to the Panacea team after placing herself under quarantine within her own home. The subject had extreme bouts of paranoia with each reported viral outbreak, such as avian flu or swine flu. She isolated herself from any human contact until publicity about the virus subsided. The subject was prone to fearful overreactions to any epidemics reported in the press, and a series of counselling sessions revealed she was unable to differentiate between reality and myth. <laughs> <laughs> With the predicted increase of medical incidents reported in the press, the subject would have been forced to spend more and more time in isolation, making simple tasks such as shopping <laughs> or visiting art galleries impossible. So the Panacea team recommended that a garden from a nearby hospital be seconded to plant tulips in the pattern of the current media hyped virus. <laughs> this scheme was planted in the patient's own garden to allow prolonged exposure to the virus's mediated image. For the first four days, the patient remained indoors in 
abject terror. By day five, these feelings lessen to high levels of anxiety. And by day seven, the patient was able to leave her own home through the garden with the assistance of a nurse. During the following month, the patient's confidence grew while leaving her house. And by day 26, she was able to leave her own home unaided. By coming to terms with the image of the virus, indeed by embracing the symmetry, the patient was able to make new associations between the virus and flowers to connote beauty rather than horror. In this way, viral planting was a highly effective antidote. Now, the subject has commenced a diploma in horticultural skills with the intention that in the future she'll be able to plant her own viruses. <laughs> this is a long-term, sustainable solution, which perfectly illustrates Panacea's approach to well-being. Well, after the uh, success of uh, the, the, the trial of the exhibition at uh, Le Parvi, we decided to do a more sophisticated uh, field trial, if you will, on on one particular exhibit in the, uh, in the exhibition um, w with a view to uh, creating a prototype that could be applied to all of the exhibits uh, in, 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 the, in the exhibition uh, in the future. Um, and uh, th this was the uh, exhibit uh, uh, called uh, Sci-Fi Hot Tub. Now, the, the Sci-Fi Hot Tub uh, is a sort of a, a, a hot tub, um, uh, beautifully arranged, um, in a, in a sort of floating iceberg, uh, inflatable iceberg, in the middle of um, a lake in, uh, in uh, the north of England, in, uh, in Kilda Forest. Um, uh, so, so we, we, uh, we uh, invited um, a, a cohort of, of subjects uh, to uh, uh, come and, and take part in, in this experiment. Um, we had uh, a, a group of uh, three uh, professional uh, trial nurses uh, from a pharmaceutical uh, phase one unit in, in London um, meet them uh, 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 at, the, at, the, at the edge of the water. Um, and uh, uh, they filled out questionnaires uh, about their health, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, they, uh, they had their blood pressure taken. Um, and they were a general uh, health and happiness, welfare and well-being questionnaire. Um, they then swam out in the cold water. They, they, they put on special uh, clothes. They wore the same clothes. Uh, they swam out uh, to the iceberg and, and were immersed in the water. And we, we arranged for some of them to be immersed for five minutes, some for 10, some 15, 20, et cetera. Um, and one group, uh, the control group, was told to go and stand under a tree. Um, <laughs> And then they came back in and uh, they repeated the questionnaire uh, and the results were collected and collated um, and uh, sent off uh, for analysis. My name is Roslyn Law and I'm a clinical psychologist. We're going to, there's three of us in the team, so we're going to run the screening part of the day which is, represents the science part of the project. So when people arrive, we register them so that we kind of have a record of who's there. We give them information about what's going to happen for the day so that they agree based on that information. It's just informed consent that we need to get from them. So they read that through and then come and speak to me. And I'm going to take them through two different questionnaires we had to fill in a form, which was the same form, an identical form to the one we filled in before we went in, assessing kind of mood, um, how we were feeling, whether we were calm or excited, tranquil, those sorts of um, emotional things, and questions about how we felt about our lives. And um, most of mine were the same, but you, the ones that you know to the ones that are, or the ones that you're aware that are different, the different responses that you give. Um, and 
I noticed that my um, feelings about technology being satisfied or dissatisfied changed from being dissatisfied before I went in the tub to being more satisfied after the tub because the tub obviously is a technological construct and um, it can be really, really good. <laughs> and it actually gives you quite a sublime experience and that's technology, not nature. David, sure. Pipe, what was it like? Oh, it was really fantastic, very relaxing, and um, quite funny as well. Well, I suppose that depends on who you're in with. But yeah, it was, it was gorgeous. Mm. I could have stayed in for ages and ages. <laughs> um, health and well-being, definitely. We should all have a, a hot tub in a lake beside where we live. Water experience, that was it's great. Yeah. Temperature experience, um, it's great. Y you have to actually feel the cold to feel it hot again and to get everything actually moving. Uh, I, di I didn't feel like my heart rate changed much going in dry. But as soon as I plunged into the cold water and got back in, I can feel it now. It's, it's really buzzing and it feels good. It feels fantastic. So uh, with the results, uh, when all the data was in uh, from, from um, uh, Sci-Fi Hot Tub, um, we uh, passed it all on to uh, uh, whiz kid uh, Dr. Adrian Renton at uh, the University of East London. Uh, I was involved in the uh, analysis of the results uh, and the results were in fact quite interesting. In this column we're looking at the average change in score in people who were in the hot tub and we can see that with the exception of overall rating of quality of life there were and there, 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 there were positive changes in all of the of, of the scores apart from satisfaction with home and satisfaction with the health service. So I think overall, given the size of the, uh, the the experiment, there is clear evidence that there are statistically significant differences before and after. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. Obsessive. Cosmic Repulsive Attraction. <laughs> a 28-year-old Caucasian male living in Gateshead was referred to the Panacea team to treat this very difficult problem he had. The subject described an obsessive fascination with the sublime in nature, yet an equally morbid fear of the natural world. He described the following situations that caused him distress. On wandering in a path in Jesmond, a small bird flew by, and he cowered in fear of his life. I'm standing before this painting, The Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, in Newcastle's Land Gallery. He broke into a cold sweat and became disorientated. Mere images of the natural world on television would cause him to feel nauseous, and the mere sound of Dedicatum's <laughs> voice the mere sound of David Attenborough's voice would cause him to perform. <laughs> the subject described his condition thus. I was spinning out into the void. There was no way out and no way through. I was becoming strange. The walls of the cage had been and dissolved. And there was a realisation that Earth was merely one tiny point in an infinitely expanding universe. And there was no firm ground to stand upon, no certainty, no security, merely waves and light shattering ascents and descents. <laughs> I was fearful, and yet I was hungry for more. I was being drawn towards that great chasm of the universe, being drawn on stellar winds. I had no map, I had no guide. Well, the poor chap won't see his GP. <laughs> and he was referred to us. After a full investigation, we diagnosed him as a, having a severe case of OCRA, Obsessive Cosmic Repulsive Attraction. If left untreated, the subject would not be able to exist outside of a fully man-made synthetic world. Therefore, after consideration, we prescribed 
an intense two-day course in sci-fi hot tub <laughs> on this man-made lake on the Scottish borders. Now, our subject, like the philosopher here, Wittgenstein, was discovering the void, and this put them both beyond the pale, alone in the universe of one. This aloneness was realised as alienation. He was both repelled and attracted to the void, which was beyond all sense. He was operating beyond the walls of his cultural and linguistic cage, and discovering the void was not only out there, it was also in here. And there was no way to avoid it. This slippage, this lack of ground to stand on, this lack of certainty, this lack of security. However, cocooned <laughs> within the security of sci-fi hot tub floating on this man-made lake, he was finally able to realise his dream of communing with the sublime. And indeed, took the first steps in realising this ever-shifting universe could indeed become his real home. So, in conclusion, we can straighten your teeth, we can fix your boobs, and we can make a baby in a test tube. And now, we can scientifically show, with our new method, which art is best for your health. Can we perhaps foresee a day where we can scientifically curate the perfect art exhibition which has the maximal positive impact on the health and well-being of the viewer? I sincerely hope so. Thank you for listening. Good night. <laughs> Transformational journey into the art of well-being. <laughs>